Hello everybody, Hassan here, engineer, MBA, and investor. And in today's video, I want to talk about Caribou Biosciences going public filing for IPO. This was done yesterday on the 1st July. I want to talk about this company. I want to talk about how special this company is and hopefully convince you after this video that this is a real company that is here to disrupt other companies in the genome editing space. That's what we want in this space. We want newer players to come in. We want different technologies to be deployed. We want leadership to execute. I want to talk about this, all about this in this video. Now, before we do the guys, please like this video, smash that like button, destroy that like button. I know a lot of you have been liking our videos. Thank you very much for the support. Subscribe if you haven't, guys. When you subscribe, say yes to notification. Get our videos to you faster through notification. Really helps this channel. And if you have anything to say about this video, guys, any input, feedback, leave it in the comment below. I'm curious to hear and see what you guys have to say about not just Caribou, but just genome editing in general. So. Obviously, last week, we started this new era in genome editing, right? We got the first ever human data on phase one clinical trial, and this was from Antilia with for in vivo genome editing. So previously, we had ex vivo from CRISPR Therapeutics, but now we have in vivo. And obviously, in vivo versus ex vivo, those are different approaches, although it is still genome editing. One is obviously more useful in different use cases than the other, right? But both are useful. But anyways, going back to what this video is about, Caribou Bioscience, I think basically they saw this opportunity in the recent weeks. Genome editing companies have been really, really propelled, uh, not just by last week's data, but just the weeks of data we got even from uh, CRISPR Therapeutics from CTI001. And it just makes sense, right? A company that was literally founded in 2011, right? Caribou Bioscience was founded in 2011 by a person called Rachel Horwitz. And she is still the founder and still obviously the CEO and president of this company, right? So over 10 years. And fun fact, guys, this was founded with Jennifer Doudna and Rachel was actually, actually a student of, of uh, Doudna. So this is not just a pretty CEO that's here to do uh, business deals and to you know, look good on the camera or on press releases. This is an actual scientist, an actual PhD student, an actual person that has touched the technologies, has actually developed in the labs with Doudna, everything and anything to do with CRISPR. And basically, she went on to found Caribou Bioscience with Jennifer Downa. Obviously, Downa is just serves just as an advisor at this point. She is not part of the daily business decisions of this company. So keep that in mind. But the fact that Downa was involved in this company, to me, I think it adds this little this missing touch that really gives this this beautiful, beautiful um aspect of this company because I, I, honestly everything that Downa touches really is gold right everything she touches is turns out to be gold right we saw what is going on with Antilia right and now we see the Caribou Bioscience going public we'll see shortly why this is so so important for this company um, to enter this public space and I think a lot of investors are going to be looking at this company really really careful Right, so this is what I'm showing here. It's the S1 filing. Obviously, if you don't know what this is, before going public, before going in public markets in the US, at least, you have to file what we call an S1. And basically, this S1 is a huge document, right? It's a huge, you can just see from the scroll bar, maybe you can't see it, but it look at how this is a huge document with hundreds of pages, right? I mean, there's like, I, I don't even know how many pages there are in this document, but obviously a lot more than 100. Right, and there's so many pages here, but really, what this document it's all about legal stuff, it's all about regulations, it's all about um, different aspects of this company. But most importantly, they talk about competitive advantage, they talk about the risk factors, they and obviously, they talk about the numbers, right? They talk about revenues, they talk about the past, I believe it's past three years revenue, past three quarters, something along those lines, but there is numbers in there, there's everything you need to know as a public investor, right? Companies don't just go public 
and you know they they have to disclose all this information because this is part of going public right that's the whole ipo initial public offering process right so obviously we will not bore you guys in this video with this s1 filing i highly advise you guys to go through it i think as an investor you definitely have to be aware of these filings i don't necessarily think you have to go through every single page but at least know that it exists and at least know where to find information if you're curious about something for example if you want to know a specific set of revenues of what happened between 2019 and 2020 i highly advise you to go through uh, S1 filing, whether that's for this company or for any company that's going public, right? Definitely advise you guys to look into it. But let's just jump here in this website here. This is obviously Caribou's uh, Biosciences website, the main page. And obviously just from here, you can see they talk about precision, allogenetic, persistence, right? Caribou is a leader in the CRISPR field, successfully le leveraging its proprietary genome editing technologies to develop allogenic cell therapies that are potentially transformative, for patients, right? So that was Jennifer Downa, right? Co-founder of Caribou, obviously co-recipient of the 2020 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, right? And what I want to put you guys, two things here. First of all, I want to go in their mission statement, right? So I don't know if you guys can do call that, but it says advancing agile genome editing innovations for benefits for patients and our communities. So the reason why I'm pointing this out, guys, is that if you compare this mission statement with other companies, so for example, CRISPR Therapeutics, Antilia, Editas, even Beam Therapeutics, they talk about human therapeutics. They talk about human diseases. But this is a different mission statement, right? Caribou Biosciences, just by their logo, just look, look at their logo, right? It's not even a human. It's not even, this is an animal, right? And this does matter. Right. Obviously, they have their leading CBO10 program that is tackling human therapeutics, obviously, the disease uh, and it, it is CAR T program and so on. But the idea that their mission statement is not just limited to humans, I really wanted to double down on this and especially in this video, because because if you guys remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, but this was you know, early on in our YouTube channel, you guys can see there's like 43 views. This was in end of March. I made this video about patents licensing, right? I made this video about patents licensing and I don't obviously uh, only 43 views. Unfortunately, didn't get many views, but the idea there is that I covered different patents licensing structures across the genome editing, which is very complicated, right? It's still not even settled in some regions. So it's so complicated, but there's a really nice graph from ARK Invest, and that's what I covered in this video. But really, I have this uh, this graph here and this table here. And basically, you can see that Caribou Bioscience, which is the company we're covering, is licensing their technology to Antilia Therapeutic, which is the number one company in the genome editing in terms of market cap as we speak. And on top of that, they're also licensing to other companies that are addressing agri agriculture, livestock, genetically engineered mice, right? Regions for research, drug screening and validation, and then obviously the T cells and therapeutics for the liver, right? So very, very interesting, right? If you compare that with, for example, CRISPR therapeutics, which only had really patents and licensing for human therapeutics, Caribou Biosciences, they're first of all, they're licensing to the number one company out there in genome editing in terms of market cap. But on top of that, on top of that, it's all about agriculture, right? Livestock. And we know how important CRISPR is in other applications than human therapeutics, right? We talked about this in the past where we believe we can eliminate world hunger. We can really address animal diseases. We can address livestock. We can address vegetation, plants through CRISPR because essentially you can edit the gene of those uh, living beings, whether that's plants, whether that's animals or humans, right? And I really found it interesting that this company mission statement does not limit to human therapeutics. I think maybe if that's what you want to take away from this video. It should be that Caribou Bioscience is a company that is going to tackle not just genome editing to eradicate diseases for humans, but also for animals, for livestock, agriculture, improve farmers' lives, improve vegetation, improve, hopefully eliminate world hunger. I think this company mission statement goes beyond just humans. 
it is stated here. I found it really interesting. Another note, again, you guys know how important it is for me when it comes to leadership and execution. That's what we saw with Antilia. They are the number one company because they were able to execute, get the job done, right? And if you take a look at this leadership board, guys, first of all, obviously, the CEO for me is the most important part, obviously, just like it should be for you as well when you're analyzing a company. This uh, Rachel Harwitz, PhD, right, student of uh, Downa, worked with Downa in the labs. In 2011, the company was founded, and she's still, still the CEO and president of this company. And I think that's just amazing. That shows stability. That shows that at the helm of this company, you have stability. But on top of that, you also have technical expertise. This is a scientist. This is a researcher. This is one of the pioneers in the CRISPR field. You know, as much as I love other companies like Beam Therapeutics and so on, imagine if you have Do Do Professor David R. Liu leading Beam Therapeutics, right? That would be even a plus, right? Although he still obviously is part of Beam Therapeutics somehow through advising and so on. I think if you had him as, at the helm, that would even reassure you. And the same goes with Antilia, right? If Dalna led Antilia, I would be totally, totally, you know, totally bullish even further, right? But it is what it is, right? And what I also want to talk about, and we will definitely not stay too much about this uh, too long, and this is highly advise you guys to go through their leadership team, is the diversity, right? You see the different genders here. You see the different ethnicities, right? And this is really important, guys. This is, for me, this is extremely important. A diverse leadership, not just in gender, but in ethnicities and in expertise. You want to see that across the board, Um I've seen leadership boards from other companies, even in genome editing companies, I will not name any, where it is very, very oriented to a single, single type of person, uh, a really image. When you look at the whole leadership board of like 10, 12, 15 people, you really see a one set of people. Again, I that's not the purpose of the channel. We try not to go through that route, but it is what it is, right? I do want to point that out. I am a big fan of diverse leadership. I'm a big fan of leadership that can get the job done, execute. I strongly believe this company is one. And in fact, in fact, in fact, another note here is talking about leadership. I was watching this um, this interview from uh, Rachel, um, the CEO of the company, and she was explaining how how the different technologies, right, from the, the traditional Cas9, CRISPR, that other companies are doing, like CRISPR Therapeutics and so on, compared to their proprietary technology of bio Caribou Bioscience, which is the CHR DNA, which is basically Chardonnay, our DNA, which is basically a combination between RNA and DNA molecules. And they talk about how there is less likely to have off-target situations, which means you improve efficiency, you improve cost, reduce cost, and reduce delays, obviously. So this technology is for real. They have proprietary technologies. And actually, what I also want to talk about, the reason why I'm pointing this video, is because the CEO here, she gave a, literally a virtual conference earlier this year, January 7, 2021, and there's only 213 views four likes, no comments. We are so early, guys. This is what you want to see in this space. You want to see these companies, these opportunities that, you know, no one is looking at because everyone is focused on the big players. And I think this is just an amazing opportunity. That's what I wanted to talk about in this video. I mean, the key takeaways of this video is pretty clear, right? What is Caribou Bioscience? What do they do? They're not just my human therapeutics. You know, talk about their leadership, talk about their the fact that you know no one really is talking about this company and talk also about how they have some proprietary technologies in this case chardonnay are our dna technology right which yield high specificity when it comes to genome editing right so i wanted to go over this uh this reddit thread that came about yesterday and i actually got in contact with this uh, author and uh, i asked him you know I asked him a question about revenues and the reason why I asked him, if I go back here, I didn't cover this really quickly, but they do have a partnership obviously with Avi, right? Huge, big pharma company, huge, 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 huge. If you don't know what, what, what is this company, just Google it, you'll, you'll know right away. 
huge partnership. So we know they have a strong partnership and we also know they have strong licensing deals, right? Obviously, the obvious here is Antilia and Novartis. Both of these companies obviously have partnership between each other through their respective programs. But the fact that Caribou Biosciences are licensing their technologies to the, all these companies you're looking at the screen, including Genos, right? Genos is the one involved with agriculture and so on. It shows me a lot, a lot of interesting things about this company, right? The fact that they are able to license their deals. And the question I asked to this author here was, what is the revenue structure, right, in terms of licensing? And it looks like in page 103 from the S1 filing, in 2019, they generated $5.8 million. And in 2020, they generated $12.36 million. Now, obviously, these are small numbers compared to what I believe their market cap will eventually be as they go public public, but it's still something you want to keep your eye on. And actually, a lot of people are bullish about being therapeutics about their licensing deals. So wait until you find out about Caribou Biosciences licensing structure deals. And no one's really sure about how these deals are structured usually. So just keep that in mind that they have strong relationships, strong partnership with Advi, strong licensing structure deals, obviously, with all these companies we took a look at, it, including the number one company in market cap in genome editing. So this, this thread here was so interesting, guys, because this guy here, he went in, he basically did due diligence on, on Caribou Biosense because, you know, they filed for IPO. And then he started talking about the history of this company, what is gene editing. And obviously, this is an art investing, so you don't really have scientists. You don't have people that are aware of genome editing, just really have investors. And... He basically went high level as to what, you know, the patents and situations are, what are the technologies. But what I wanted to put our, our focus on is, you know, some of these sentences, and maybe, you know, we can build upon that, is that, you know, Caribou Biosciences was founded by Downa and one of her graduate students, Rachel Arwitz, now CEO and president of, of Caribou. In 2015, they raised $11 million in the Series A fun funding with Novartis and DuPont. And that year, they also researched collaboration with two other companies. We talk about their collaborations and so on, right? At this point, CRISPR has been focused on finding, CRISPR's technology in general is really about genetic diseases, especially when it comes to human therapeutics. But the company itself is focusing also on everything with food, with plants, with animals, with industrial biology, right? In 2016, they really hired an uh, individual there that actually spent only less than a year in the company, but I believe they really wanted to make a push in the agriculture, right? So that shows that the company, the leadership, Rachel and the leadership team are not just thinking about human therapeutics, right? And Series B financing, it totaled to 30 million. And I believe they had a Series C fin financing just recently, about 100 million, but we'll take a look briefly. But more importantly, guys, their leading program right now actually entered in phase one clinical, already clinical trial, right? No data yet. I believe the data is expected to come in 2022, right? So less than a year, guys, less than a year, the data will come in. You guys saw what happened with Antilia when phase one data come in, came in. Just keep it that in mind. Again, not financial advice. You guys just got to do your own research. But Caribou's CB010 program, that is the leading program in their Field. Obviously, it's, a, it's all about CAR T therapies. It is off shelf, right? Off shelf. Keep that in mind. It is off shelf, which means that you don't have to extract cells from the patient. This is um, this could be done obviously without extracting the, the patient cells. Obviously, this is something that we haven't really covered. I think I know there's a lot of confusion about this, but it's the idea that you could get your cells from a, like a form like a cell bank right, from obviously donors and modify those cells and then implement those uh, into the patient eventually to basically as a treatment, right? That's the whole point of treating the patient, right, and eventually. And obviously, they have other programs like o O11, O12, and I won't go over all their programs. Maybe it'll be done through a future video as we go closer of the IPO. Uh, and then, obviously, they raised some money here in... Um, I believe, yeah, in March of this year, they raised $115 million in Series Cs. And you have investors like Avvi, you know, Farallon Capital Management. So the big, big players are entering the space. And then there's really three areas, the research efforts that, you know, this company is focusing on, the CAR-C 
cell therapies, there are the CAR and K cell therapies for solid tumors, and then there's the whole Chardonnay RDNA technology platform. So these are like the three verticals that they're really going hard from their website. We took a look at their website just briefly, but that's really what they're looking at. I believe there's a fourth one. I believe agriculture is for real in this company. I think they're bound to announce big news with agriculture, with biology, with plants, with animals. But again, that's just speculation. I just think a company that you know, has the licensing structure deals that has all the patents for it, just makes sense to double down on it and to sort of deficient, like have this competitive advantage compared to other genome editing. We believe there'll be many winners in this space, right? But you just cannot do exactly the same thing as other players, right? Although they have prior technologies, you know, human therapeutics are being addressed by many other companies. Although we need other companies to enter the space, no one is really covering the whole agriculture, the whole biology, the whole plants, animal situation in the public markets as we speak. So this could be a whole new market that they could unlock in terms of investors pouring their money into it, right? So, and then this uh, this person here talks about what uh, the Chardonnay uh, RDNA technology is about. It's a hybrid of RNA and DNA molecules that really reduces any inefficiencies when it comes to off targets. Uh, because, you know, when you deploy these uh, traditional CRISPR, right, there is possible of off-target hit, which means that you basically modify a sequence that you weren't supposed to modify. So, you know, this technology, this proprietary technology, the bio Caribou Bioscience claim have, they claim to be much more efficient. Again, they have early data for it. That's exactly what phase one clinical tri trial data is all about. At some point, you know, it is what it is. So. IV uses Caibou's Chardonnay editing to develop two new CAR T cell therapies. So this is not just theories. This is not just research papers, guys. This is being deployed. This is being implemented. They want to figure out if this technology, proprietary te technology, is really here to stay. I strongly believe it is from the data I took a look at, even the previous video we just took a look at. But we'll see. We'll see how where it goes with that. And then this is from Caibou's S1. Now we're going in a little bit in detail with numbers here. But again, the drug line pipe one, uh, sorry, page one of the S1 in for CB010 phase one initial data is expected to happen in 2022 in less than a year, guys. We're almost like second half of, we're basically in the second half of 2021. Time goes really fast. Um, I strongly believe this company will have positive data. I, I, I really do, guys. I think if you're going public, obviously you need to raise money, you need to reward your early investors and obviously your early employees and current employees um, and newer employees, obviously. Um, so there's that, but there's also the fact that you know, the whole space is blowing up. They're looking at these companies like Antilia going public and making this much and basically being the number one company market size. And they're like, hey, how come we can't? profit from some of those, you know, how can we can get some of those, uh, some of those um, investments, right? We believe we have the technology, we believe we have proprietary technology, hell, we even, you know, license some of our technology to Intelia, so why not, right? Um, and some of the important here, they own 48 issued U.S. patents, including seven U.S. patents covering the Chardonnay RDNA technologies, 290 issued foreign patents, 93 patent applications around the world. I am um, not a big fan of patents. I strongly believe everything should be open source. I strongly believe that um, I think that, you know, that's how you drive innovation, but it is what it is, right? We have to live in the world we live in. And that's a fact that's as an investor, you have to recognize there are patents out there. Companies have to play by the rules of regions, of countries, of nations. And that is one of the rules, right? You cannot infringe on patents because you're going to get lawsuits. And then the fact that they hold this many patents to me, that is a bullish sign. Uh, they have exclusive license agreement with several uh, institutions. We already talked about this, like I said in our previous video, which only had 43 video views. So hopefully you guys can watch that video from our from our older videos back in March this year. And then they have a large institution inside investors. That's actually something I want to talk about is two things here. Um, so obviously you have some big players owning some pretty big numbers here, like uh, this uh, first here, 9% from Pri Capital Partner. You can bet that these guys are waiting to cash out, like all these early people, including the Jennifer Downer, right? And including the CEO, right? 
I mean, the CEO owns 9.33% and Dalna owns 6.28%. That's about over 16%, guys. Almost 16% of the company is owned by two individuals, right? Essentially, right? By the CEO and basically by Dalna. So I, I, I do believe that's a risk factor. I do believe that's significant. Um, I think anyone that thinks that they will not be cashing out through the public market is extremely naive. I mean, they have to cash out, not just for tax reasons, but also uh, just for rebalancing their portfolio. Now, these these individuals with high net worth, they have a huge team of uh, accountants and finance experts that, you know, they, they have no other choice to diversify their portfolio, right? And to, just, you know, not everyone is like Elon Musk, guys. Like, these, these people are very... Uh, most people are very risk adverse and I'd be very surprised if they would not be cashing out. So that is one risk I see. I am not a big fan of individuals owning this much. But again, you know, you could have made the same argument on Elon Musk and Tesla and not invest in Tesla because Elon Musk owned at the time and still owns a big portion of Tesla. So it is what it is. You know, you got to keep that in mind. I don't think it's a huge risk factor, but it is one. I do believe this is something that you want to keep in note. And there are other institutions here you're looking at. They definitely want to cash out. I mean, if you're holding these companies, we talk, look, look, some of these companies' investments were done back in thousand, you know, years ago, right? Over almost 10 years ago. So keep that in mind, you know, they want to cash out. They want to rebalance their portfolio. So, you know, I, we never provide financial advice, but you got to be aware of that. You got to be aware of these that dynamic dynamics um in this space and then as a conclusion here really the the person here on this reddit thread talks about how caribou is still years away from fda approval and we know this not just for caribou for other companies as well um but they really have a, a differentiator when it comes to editas and tilia crispy therapeutics with their proprietary technologies with chardonnay our dna but also the fact that they, they've already licensed structured deals across the board, including agriculture, plants, animals, and foods. And I strongly believe this company will branch out. I don't think they'll stay with those uh, CBO uh, 10 and CBO 11 and 12 that we saw from the human therapeutics when it comes to CAR C, CAR T cell therapies. I think they'll, or even the Chardonnay or DNA, I think they'll branch out to go even double down on agriculture, double down on livestock. I think human therapeutics right now is definitely needed because that's what you need. Uh, that's what the, the attention is at. And ultimately, you know, we want to eradicate disease is very important. But if you can unlock that, that agriculture, plants, animals field, I think there are opportunities there. Again, guys, that's what I want to do in this video. I want to talk about, you know, why this company is important it's gone public it, it was sorry it is going public it filed for ipo usually it goes to four to eight weeks i've been told when you file for the s1 that's the usual time frame so we can expect this company to go public trading in public markets by sometime around august maybe second half of august first half of august not sure but sometime around there uh, you can bet I'll have my eyes on this company. Uh, it does this article here that talks really briefly. I won't go over it, but it also talks about what, uh, why Chardonnay, our DNA technology is so important, why it is so, so important for this company to promote it, why is it so important for this company to also state the fact that their CBO 010 is about uh, off-shelf uh, technology where it is ready made for patient usage and the CEO says that many of these patients don't have two to six weeks to wait you know to extract the cells put it in manufacturing facility edit it and then transport it deliver it back to the patient that's a, a long delays that patients do not have they want to cut that time to zero right and that is very attractive in terms of uh, business model uh, and a lot of experts are looking at this and they are salivating on this they many patients want this obviously we talked about the importance of you know who are the big winners right the big winners are not investors early investors the big winners are the patients right never forget about this whether we're talking about humans animals plants vegetation we are talking about the living beings um, so this is very important, guys. I think this company is for real. I think there are opportunities in this. I see the leadership. I see the potential execution. We'll see how it goes. I want to cover this video. I want to provide you guys free information. Hopefully, you guys found value from it. If you did, guys, like this video. Smash that like button. Destroy that like button. If you haven't subscribed, guys, what are you waiting for? And I want to hear about you guys, what you think. 
about caribou biosciences what do you know that we perhaps don't know share it in the comments below guys give us information help us out just like how i'm helping you out let's, as a community let's help each other's out this is how we improve this is how we get better and this is how ultimately we can level the playing field for all investors including the average citizen the average person and not just let these huge institutions win over time so thank you very much for watching have a great saturday and we'll see each other's tomorrow thank you very much